Right now, Avatar The Way of Water is making all the money at the box office. It looks like it's gonna cross the $2 billion mark and give James Cameron his third film in the top five highest grossing movies of all time. So, while billions are on the mind, I thought, why not stop and rank all 52 movies that have made a billion dollars from the worst to the best. full list of movies is in the description. Share your ranking down below in the comments. And before we get started, today's video is brought to you by Cometeer. Cometeer is a completely new coffee format and the way it works is pretty cool. Literally, their coffee is flash frozen to lock in the freshness and then they send it to you frozen to maximize the freshness. It's super simple and kind of fun if you like to play in the kitchen like me. First, we have to heat our water. While that's heating up, I'll select my flavor. I'm gonna go with Morning Glint. It's got notes of caramel, cola, chocolate. It speaks my language. I'm gonna take my capsule and run it under water for about 10 seconds to loosen it from the edges. Then you drop the puck in your glass and add your hot water. It's as simple as that. You got a fresh cup of coffee and my dog steps in the way for the shot. It's as simple as that. You've got a fresh cup of coffee and the capsule is made of aluminum, so it's recyclable. It's fun, quick, and easy to make. It makes my house smell fantastic, which my wife loves. And because it's fresh, it has these big, bold flavors. The way it works is that Cometeer delivers monthly shipments to your door. You customize the boxes to your roast preferences, keep the capsules in your freezer, and simply melt into your beverage of choice, hot or cold. What I like about it is that it makes it super easy to make my morning as well as my afternoon coffee, but it also allows me to try different styles. Like I made hot coffee earlier because that's what I'm used to, but it's just as easy to make iced coffee, something which is new to me. No mess, no stress. For a limited time, you can get $50 off. Use code Sean Chandler at cometeer.com slash Sean Chandler to get this amazing offer. And let's get started. In last place, Minions. I can see how on paper it looked like a good idea to take the adorable side characters from Despicable Me and spin them off into their own film. But as soon as you stop and think about it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Minions don't learn, grow, or change, or speak a discernible language. Maybe do. Uh, banana. Uh, start. So having them as the central characters immediately just makes it very difficult to have a holistic, compelling story with heart and emotion when your characters are designed to be cute, adorable, and do base level humor and slapstick jokes. Number 51, Transformers Age of Extinction. This is where the Transformers franchise just completely went off the rails for me. I mean, I like Mark Wahlberg. Michael Bay does know how to do big, gigantic spectacle action sequences, but they just stopped caring about having a coherent, compelling script where it felt like there was a purpose for everything going on. And this just feels like a big, gigantic, bloated mess with a bunch of explosions where fireworks shoot out everywhere. Everyone is quipping with the most base level humor. And it's a movie where it feels like they spent more time trying to justify how a guy is able to date Mark Wahlberg's underage daughter? I just called the cops on you because this is illegal. She's a minor. Protect the mother Romeo and Juliet laws. Statute 2705-3. Texas statute? Than they did in trying to justify why anything happening in the plot is happening. And so this one actually would be at the bottom of the list, except they shot all of the Texas stuff at Mark Wahlberg's house just a few miles down the road. So that's kind of fun to see whenever I rewatch this movie. Otherwise... It's just a bad Transformers movie. Bringing us into the top 50, Alice in Wonderland. Once again, on paper, seems like a great idea to pair up Tim Burton with Alice in Wonderland, but something just got lost in translation and all the wit and wordplay of Lewis Carroll's original writing seems to have gotten completely lost and it's been exchanged with blockbuster cliches, turning Alice into like a hero's journey I mean, it is bizarre how it strips away everything unique about Alice in Wonderland and gives us generic blockbustery stuff while still kind of having Tim Burton graphics that seem to match up with Alice in Wonderland. So a movie that should be so much better than it is, but it just does not really work for me. 49, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. I love the original Jurassic Park. 
you will see it show up very high on this list. And I enjoy a lot of the other films in the franchise. And I feel like this one just kind of completely missed the mark where I go to these films to see dinosaurs brought back to life, not watch them go extinct on an island and be burned to death by lava. So I think just at the core of the story, what they kind of do in the first half is just not what I want to see in this franchise. And from there, it takes it to this very bizarre direction where we're in an, a mansion and terrorists are bidding to buy laser guided raptors or something like that. That's a laser raptor. I thought they went extinct thousands of years ago. It's just such a bizarre direction to take things. They introduce human cloning. It's like a movie with too many ideas, but none of the right ideas. And so there's a few fun moments. There's a few beats that I think have some nice tension as a whole. Doesn't work for me. Next up, Star Wars The Last Jedi, possibly the most polarizing film on this entire list because some of you are gonna see my placement and think, Amazing. Every word of what you just said was wrong. Cause you've got it in your top five on this list. For me, I see a movie from a director who has a very different idea of what Star Wars is than what I have of what it is. And so it takes Luke Skywalker to places that I just can't buy. And maybe there would have been a way if Force Awakens had set up this film that I could buy into where they have Luke at. But when they just have such a big leap from where we saw him in Return of the Jedi to him just tossing his lightsaber behind him and becoming this cynical, cranky old man, I just don't buy it. And then there's a bunch of other things in it that don't add up to me with the way characters are treated, the moments that are supposed to be powerful. They just ring hollow. They feel contrived. And so I, I, I just don't get it. There's a bunch of gorgeous sequences and a bunch of stuff that just does not work for me and does not feel like it's a logical place for these characters to be. 47, The Lion King 2019. Of all the movies on this list, this is the movie that had the sharpest drop from how I felt about it when I first watched it versus how I feel about it now because I thoroughly enjoyed the initial experience I had watching this movie. It was at a press screening at a true IMAX theater, uh, one in downtown Austin, massive screen, so very immersive. And the original Lion King is one of my favorite movies. It will appear higher up on this list, much higher up on this list. And so that was cool. And then there's the rest of the time with this movie where I kind of go, why would I ever rewatch this version of the film when I have the original? I just have no reason to check this out. It brings nothing to the table that I care about besides the sheer novelty of its technological wonder. But as soon as you don't have an IMAX screen to wow me with that, there's just not much here of interest because so much of the charm of The Lion King is these anthropomorphic animals that are lively and make facial expressions. And that does not jive with the idea of photorealistic lions and animals because animals do not emote like humans. And so it just rings hollow. You're watching like, wow, I can't believe this is all done in computers. And at the same time being like, I feel nothing because these are lions. They can't smile. They can't frown. They can't emote. And that's at the core of what makes, brings to life uh, these stories. 46, Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. And this is another movie that had a pretty significant drop from how I felt about it when I initially watched it to how I feel about it now. There's always some excitement when you see a new Star Wars movie. This one is designed a little bit more to pander to traditional fans that weren't entirely happy with The Last Jedi. And that's kind of exactly the problem here. It's a movie that clearly wasn't part of their original plan because they this movie exposed that they had no plan. They were reactionary, in which case J.J. Abrams was going in one direction and then Ryan Johnson wanted to go in this other direction. And then J.J. took it back this other way. And there's nothing cohesive about this trilogy of films. Therefore, when you get to this movie, it just kicks off with Palpatine has started a podcast. 
what <laughs> what just happened? Nothing feels properly set up, therefore nothing feels satisfying when it pays off. There's a few beats that are kind of nice. There's some ideas like, I kind of dig that, but um, it's it's above Last Jedi because I don't feel like it, it violates what I think Star Wars is as much as Last Jedi, but Last Jedi is probably a more coherent, cohesive film in and of itself. But the key thing here is that Kathleen Kennedy did not deliver a trilogy. It feels like each movie is at odds with the movie that came before it. And that's weird, and this movie kind of epitomized that. 45, Beauty and the Beast live action. Most of my thoughts here are a bit of an echo of what I said about The Lion King, where the initial experience of seeing this movie was a lot of fun. I took my uh, oldest daughter to go see it, and so it was, I think, maybe the first movie I took just her to go see, and she had the bell dress and everything. So that's just a great memory of taking her to get to see this movie that I saw when I was a child, when the original film came out. That was cool. But just like with the Lion King remake, if I'm in the mood to watch Beauty and the Beast, I'm going to watch the original one. There's not really much here that adds anything. I mean, there's a new song that's a, there's a good enough new song, but then there's other stuff that it's like, why did we add the Black Plague <laughs> to Beauty and the Beast? Like, what's kind of going on here? So it's, I think, a better film in general than The Lion King simply because uh, it's people and it's not trying to be a photorealistic beast because beasts don't exist. So it can emote better and it works a little bit better. But once again, I'm just going to choose to watch the original film rather than this one. Then we have Pirates of the Caribbean on Stranger Tides. This movie suffers from much the same problem as Minions in that... Jack Sparrow is a phenomenal character in the original Pirates of the Caribbean because he's not entirely the lead. We have other characters that can have these big, gigantic, compelling arcs, and Jack just has a little bit of a change, a little bit of a heart to him. You can grow, learn a little bit more about him, but he's not a character that you want to suddenly become someone different. You don't want him to become that much better of a version of himself. Therefore, when you kind of remove Orlando Bloom and Kira Knightley from the mix and put Jack Sparrow, Johnny Depp front and center for everything, you're missing a character to give it a, a, a journey with emotional weight to it. Like you, he's entertaining. He's phenomenally fun and charismatic, all that stuff, but he's not the thing that you center a story around. He's the guy that you throw into the mix to make someone else's journey so much more fascinating. So when you got to this point in time in the franchise, I think it just kind of really suffered because of that. And you just get a really kind of forgettable movie with just retreading different things from the previous films. And it just didn't it, like, it doesn't leave any mark for me. There's nothing memorable about this film at all. And as a bonus negative for this one, this is the film with the highest reported budget of all time. The most expensive movie ever made. And I can't remember a single action sequence from this film. I do not know where that budget went. I remember all sorts of action sequences from every other Pirates of the Caribbean movie because they were interesting, fun, and the budget was on display for me to see. I don't know where this budget went. They had more money to make a movie than anyone ever before. And since, Way of Water might actually have cost more, but you see the budget for that movie. This one, I don't know where the money went. And so they have no excuses for making a forgettable film. 43, The Hobbit, An Unexpected Journey. Now, I've said it many times before. I'm not like a gigantic Tolkien fan or anything like that. Of course, the Lord of the Rings trilogy are, are phenomenal films. Very well made. And I've seen them many, many, many times. And I, and I enjoy them. But I'm not someone that's ever been super duper into Middle Earth in and of itself. And I think the big p appeal of kind of this Hobbit trilogy is just spending a lot of time in Middle Earth, just having these whimsical little adventures. But if you're not someone that inherently just loves Middle Earth and the world of Tolkien, this movie and the rest of this trilogy feels like they took a small book 
and stretched it out to try and make it into the Lord of the Rings when it was never designed to be that. And so it's just a, a movie that's kind of too slow, takes too long to get going. And when things do happen, they feel too big for the story that we're actually telling. It's harmless. It doesn't you know, bother me the way some of the movies lower on this list do. It just feels like a movie that um, is stretching everything out too much because they were. They originally set out to be two movies and they're like, no, let's do it a trilogy. In which case you're just padding out the runtime. 42, Captain Marvel. For me, this is one of the clunkier films in the MCU that has some weird tonal issues, some very odd performances, in particular with some of the stuff they do with Annette Benning, and just kind of the journey that they take our lead character to do villain twist reveals. Chris, for a very odd scenario, when you rethink what happened in the first film with all the scroll that are killed by our lead character with the jokey tone in the back half, it, it just doesn't kind of feel cohesive to me. And I don't feel like they've, whether in this movie or in Endgame, figured out how to properly write Captain Marvel yet. Is that like a personal attack or something? And so she either comes off too snarky or she's being told who she is at the first part of this movie. So they haven't kind of found that right balance with her yet. Now, I do think this movie has some things that are kind of interesting, in particular, seeing a young, less cynical Nick Fury I dig that part. There's even some kind of x file type vibes in that section of the film, seeing the 90s version of the MCU. There's some fun to be had, um, but just as a whole, it, it's just kind of a, a weird film. 41, Jurassic World Dominion. This movie just barely squeaked in, making a billion dollars to get onto this list. And this was one of my most disappointing films of last year. Now, I didn't I didn't hate it the way that some people did. That is one big pile of shit. But at the end of Fallen Kingdom, obviously a movie much lower on this list, they teased, we're going to do Jurassic World for real. Dinosaurs are out in the world. And then they put out this short film a few years back about people in this RV and it was like really good. Like what if there were dinosaurs out there and you could just go camping and dinosaurs could show up like, oh, this is going to be really cool. And then they said, we're going to bring back the characters from the original trilogy. And they're not just cameos. They are like actual major parts of the story. The trailer hit all the right notes. I was like, this thing might actually be really good. Then we saw the movie and it's about locusts in corporate espionage. <laughs> Are you serious? You brought back Alan Grant to have him run around evil Apple headquarters and play around with computers. Like, the thing he's not good at, the thing he's not interesting doing, that's what you had him doing. So it was great to see those characters again. There's always some monster mayhem destruction in these movies that I'm going to love. But of all the things to do with dinosaurs on the loose, why would you put all of them on a preserve away from the world and put us in a like sterile corporate environment for most of the runtime and make the plot about locusts and crops. In 40th place, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. I feel like I enjoy this movie more than a lot of people. And I think what's so frustrating about this movie for me is that I feel I can look at it and very easily see how there could have been a better version of it if you just have Anakin be the same age as Padme, um, remove Jar Jar and make the Gungans less goofy and maybe rework just a little bit the way that it does the politics and like layer it instead of having it all in one big chunk. And all of a sudden you have a movie that has this big sweeping journey that mirrors a new hope with Anakin, makes the romance make a lot more sense than 16 year old girl with little child. And you can actually have the our young Anakin do something more interesting in the finale, but they didn't do that. In which case, it feels goofy to have a kid in the final battle in a starship like, whoops, I fell in a starship. Now I'm up in a battle accidentally winning. You've got Jar Jar stepping in poop. You've got Gungans going, doing stuff like that. And none of that needed to be there. Like these are all, these are solvable problems. And the structure, the concept of how it plays into this point in time in the world of Star Wars, I think is interesting and compelling. And then we get poop jokes, children and 
Number 39, The Fate of the Furious. And by this point in time in the Fast and the Furious franchise, they were all out just kind of going bonkers, coming up with the wackiest ideas possible for all these scenarios. So, you know, it ends with cars driving on ice, with submarines shooting at them, the rock grabbing torpedoes while driving a car. It's ridiculous. All that stuff is still pretty fun for me. They're Taco Bell movies. They're cinematic fast food, very enjoyable. On this list, we got a bunch of Taco Supremes much higher up on this list. But uh, I think what kind of holds this particular Fast and the Furious movie back for me is the central device of it is that the family is up against Dom, which is interesting. It's different. You can see why it was an ex a risk worth, you know, let's maybe take this risk, risk. Let's try something a little bit different. But it also kind of removes the charm of the franchise. Not a great plan. If the whole thing's about Dom and his family, his relationship with them, having him be the bad guy and them trying to stop him and figure out why um, the end result, it just loses a little something that you want. Some of that fun's gone. So it didn't doesn't pull together as well as some of the other movies and are at this point in time in the franchise that are just you know ridiculous fun. 38, Despicable Me 3. And this is a franchise that I always feel is better in the parts than the whole. There's characters that are really fun and lively. The minions are always hilarious. In the case of this movie, I think the main villain is this 80s inspired child star. Um, it's a lot of fun, but I find those parts better than the whole when it all kind of comes together. And so yeah, the idea of bringing in Drew's twin, that's kind of fun. Uh, like I said, the villain's fun. Minions are always fun. I just don't ever find the, the plot here particularly compelling. And I feel like by this point in time in the, the, the series, they've kind of introduced all of these different characters and things. So you lose some of what the original one was about. Drew being the father to these girls. Second one, he finds love. Third one, it's now about his brother. But now we also still have girl in the mix, children in the mix. And so it just kind of got a little bit lost. I mean, it's good. It's watchable. Uh, it's fine. But um, I feel like this franchise kind of had some diminishing returns after the original. Number 37, Spider-Man Far From Home. And I'm sure for a lot of you, this is a flaming hot take. How dare you? And you're thinking about clicking that dislike button and getting on out of here. And I get that. But uh, this movie is actually a lot more polarizing than I originally realized. And many of you love it. Fair enough. There's some fun to be had. There's some great jokes. Jake Hip Gyllenhaal is a lot of fun. Brilliant casting for him as Mysterio. The Mysterio sequences are really, really cool. I just don't think the plot for this movie holds up at all. Where... The entire premise of this film is that Tony Stark left his military grade glasses to a high schooler who'd been dead for five years with no instructions or training plan. <laughs> that doesn't work for me. I can't get past that. And then once again, for the seventh time in MCU history, a villain is motivated by scorn for Tony Stark. Me, baby, one more time. And when I look at this movie, it has some fun parts, some jokes I laugh at. The story, the motivations don't work. And I don't even know, like, what is Mysterio's end goal in all of this? If he succeeds in his plan, it's to be a fake superhero? Next up, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. And this is a movie I've tried so very hard to like more than I actually like it because I love the original film and the director, the cast, it's all back. It goes bigger, more ambitious. And I think that's almost kind of the problem. The first one was big, it was ambitious, but it kind of kept its eye on being fun at the same time. And this one tries to do so much stuff. It gets so kind of convoluted and all the mythology and all the characters and everything going on that it, it just doesn't pull together and it doesn't deliver as fun of an experience. Certain sequences are really cool and they went all out, but like if I'm in the mood 
for a Pirates of the Caribbean film, I always go back towards the original film. And when I rewatch Swiss One, I'm always disappointed. Ever since it came out, I was there opening day, so excited for this movie. And it didn't deliver what I hoped for. 35, Finding Jewelry, a movie that's, it's fine. It's a, a good enough follow-up to Finding Nemo. Some of the moments about Dory getting lost from her parents and rediscovering them still have that Pixar emotional punch. But the film as a whole far too often just feels like a rehash of Finding Nemo. It just tr goes in too much of the same direction, touches on too much of the same path, too many similar jokes that if I'm in the mood to go swimming with the fishes, I'm just gonna go with Finding Nemo. 34 Transformers Dark of the Moon. And of the Michael Bay directed Transformers films, I believe this is the best of the sequels. That's not a particularly high bar, but it is saying something. And, um, you know, the plot here, we've reached the point in time in the franchise where it's paper thin. This one, I think, at least had kind of a bit of a villain twist that I didn't see coming that made things a little bit interesting. And delivers, I think, the best spectacle finale of the franchise. The last hour of this movie is just gigantic buildings destroyed while people run out of them. I mean, it's spectacle on this whole other level. And for such a long period of time as robots battle robots in a downtown area. And so it's pretty cool on that level. So as I go to these movies to watch robots punch each other in the face and blow stuff up, this is the one that does that with at least enough story, enough of a villain that I care about it and not later films where it just annoyed me with how little plot there was. Then we have The Dark Knight Rises. And as a point of reference, I do go positive on this film. I do enjoy this film, but I would also say of Christopher Nolan's movies that have actual budgets, this is the weakest of his films. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. And in its attempts to go so big and ambitious with the story, it has to cut some corners and do some screenwriting cheating in ways that traditionally Christopher Nolan films haven't done that. And so there's just more plot holes, there are more lapses in logic, there's more things where you kind of go, wait a minute, how did that happen? Why did that happen? What just happened? Why is it suddenly daytime? It's a lot of that stuff that kind of takes place in order to tell this big gigantic story and pull in specific plot lines from comic books. And when it hits, it hits hard. There's some great performances, there's some great moments, there's some great scenes. It definitely gives me the feels in the final 10 minutes, but it's also the movie that feels like this is where Christopher Nolan veers the farthest from the Batman mythology to kind of do his own thing so he can close it out when he wants. So a movie that does a lot of things right. Of course. And cuts some corners to get there and makes some choices I'm not crazy about. 32 Avengers Age of Ultron. This movie gives us more of everything from the first Avengers. More threats, more plot lines, more characters, more quips. And it's an example of bigger not always being better. When this movie hits, it's just as good as the first Avengers. But it's an example of a, a movie where the parts aren't as good as the whole. And there's rumors, speculation that maybe Whedon's cut was originally going to be significantly longer and they kind of had to trim it down a good bit to squeeze everything in. And it's a movie that feels like there was a lot of kind of Kevin Feige mandated plot points that had to be squished in there. So when you watch the film, for me, this is the most confusing film in the MCU where things happen that aren't explained for a few more scenes and it quickly moves from plot point to plot point to plot point in a way in which it's not the easiest to follow. Not that like I'm totally lost, but of MCU films, these aren't like super complex plots. And there's moments in this where I'm like, what, what's kind of going on here? So there's so many great sequences, makes me laugh, but I, I think they tried to do a little bit too much in the runtime that they had. 31 Iron Man 3. And I would say, save for the ill-advised Mandarin twist, which 
was certainly not a great idea, subverted my expectations, but it didn't deliver something better than what I was expecting. So I made a decision and it was wrong. It was a bad call, Ripley. Save for the Mandarin twist, I, I think this is a much, much, much better film than people give it credit for. Shane Black's writing fits really nicely with Tony Stark as a character and Robert Downey Jr.'s delivery. There's a bunch of interesting, memorable action sequences and you get a kind of a journey for Tony Stark. Now, it is a movie that feels like they weren't quite sure what the future of Tony Stark was in the MCU. So they give him a finale, send off the character, and then he comes right back shortly afterwards in Age of Ultron. So it, it plays a little bit strange with the rest of the MCU but it's kind of a standalone, subversive Shane Black superhero movie. I, I think this movie works. We've made it to number 30 with Furious 7. And by this point in time in the list, these are all movies that I thoroughly enjoy for different reasons and in different ways. But these are all movies that I, I just really enjoy at this point in time. And with Furious 7, absolutely falls into that Taco Bell movie category. Probably was the Taco Supreme of the year that it came out. As by this point in time in this franchise, it was getting ridiculous. Cars are driving through buildings onto other buildings. Wow. You've got The Rock holding a machine gun, battling drones and helicopters. Wow. And Vin Diesel battling Jason Statham with pipes and smashing roads by curb stopping on it. Wow. It's ridiculous. It's all out warfare. But the thing that's really surprising about this movie is that it's actually coherent. This is, of course, is the film where Paul Walker tragically died mid-production. They hadn't finished shooting all of his scenes and they were able to kind of pull it together using his brothers as stand-ins and a bunch of different CGI. And, you know, there's some shots where you can tell something's, something's up. There's a couple parts where the story gets a little bit clunky, but they they pulled off a, 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 a tribute that honors him. When the movie ends... And they're doing that, the song and the final ride, they, they pulled it off. They, they What needed to work absolutely worked. Plus, you get cars parachuting out of planes and things like that. And so, you know, this is a ludicrous movie. It's ridiculous. Um, my kind of ridiculous. These are, this is... This is probably where the end of the peak of the franchise for me was after this, they started really going downhill. 29 Avatar of the real James Cameron films. This is my least favorite of the bunch. And I still think it is a very good film that I thoroughly enjoy, but it does have a very derivative formulaic story on a technological level. Obviously, James Cameron did something incredible here in what he was able to do with the motion capture, these photorealistic Navi creatures. Uh, but beyond that, he creates just an immersive experience where you really feel like you're going into this world. He takes you on a big gigantic journey to get things. Huge spectacle. I just wish that he did it <laughs> with a story that hasn't been done so many times before. And many people have joked about Fern Gully in space, Pocahontas with blue people or whatever, but it's true. It fits beat for beat into all these other stories. And if you're going to spend so much time on this technological wonder and so much craft in the storytelling and the emotional beats, why not do it with a fresh story? Next up, Aladdin. I know most of these Disney live action remakes get a pretty bad rap. The other ones on this list are way down near the bottom. I think this one actually kind of slaps. <laughs> Was it too soon? In reality, this is by far, of these Disney live action remakes, the one that has been replayed in my house the best. And the one that I think something gets added by being live action. It is a bit more of an adventure film. And so some of that translates really nicely into the format. But also a big part of the hook of the original was Robin Williams as the genie. And you bring in Will Smith, He's just as fun, charismatic, energetic as Robin Williams, but in a totally different way, in which case it's a whole different energy, a different vibe that 
justifies the existence of the film. And so um, of these Disney live action remakes, this is one of the absolute best in my mind. 27 Aquaman, and I'm not entirely sure, this isn't a definitive statement, but I'm pretty sure right around this point in time, we're halfway through the list, every movie here on out are films that were, are in my top 10 movies of the year that they came out. I like blockbusters. I like big spectacle films. I'm a sucker for these types of movies. And thus, there's a reason that they made a lot of money. They resonated with people like me. So here on out, these are a lot of movies that I had a lot of fun with. Or if they're tragedies, movies that I felt appropriately sad about. In the case of Aquaman, it's a silly comic book movie that knows it's a silly comic book movie. Right from the get-go, it makes it very clear it's in on this, the joke. It's in on the fact that he's called Aquaman. There's a, a goofy side to all of this, but it's not laughing at Aquaman. It's just aware of it and it leans into it. James Wan does a great job of framing the action sequences with wide shots so you can see what's taking place. The actual choreography, it's not cut all to pieces. It's far enough back and long enough takes that you get cool action sequences. You get all sorts of wacky, wild stuff in the third act with these sea creatures. And it's telling this big globe-trotting adventure that, you know, has Shakespearean elements about half-brothers taking the throne and who's meant to rule, all that fun stuff. And all, well, being aware, you know, we're riding on fishing, talking fish and stuff like that. Moving into the top half of the list with Zootopia. And fun fact on this one, this is the first movie that my two oldest children saw in the theater back in 2016. First time took them to the movies. So this one always kind of have a special place in my heart, but it's just a, a real fun mix of cute animals, buddy cop formula, a mystery and a message, all of that kind of at the same time, but real cohesive. The message doesn't feel forced. It's all done through story. The, the jokes work, you buy into the chemistry of our two leads. And so it takes a simple formula that's worked in action movies for decades, applies it to Disney animation, and you get something fresh, fun, and new. Number 25, Jurassic World. And this is an absolute taco supreme for me. This is a movie that is total cinematic junk food. I love it, I eat it up, gobble it up. And at the same time, if you don't like it, if you think it's too stupid, I totally understand. I can't defend this movie on a logical level if you stop and think about a bunch of things like they're trying to militarize velociraptors, that doesn't sound very cost-effective or intelligent. Um, all sorts of stuff about it, really dumb. But is it a lot of fun to watch dinosaurs run wild in an amusement park? Yes, it is. Is it a lot of fun to watch Chris Pratt ride on a motorcycle with velociraptors to go battle a genetically engineered dinosaur monster? Yes, it is. And is it a lot of fun to watch Chris Pratt team up with a T-Rex, the T-Rex from the first Jurassic Park, and a velociraptor to battle a genetically engineered dinosaur monster? Absolutely it is, especially at the end where he high-fives the T-Rex, or at least I think he should have high-fived the T-Rex at the end of the film. So it's indefensible on a logic level, but it delivered the goofy fun I wanted. 24 Avatar The Way of Water. And as I just mentioned, we're at a point in time where these movies are all kind of in my top 10s of the year. So this movie just a few weeks back was in my top 10 of last year. Just such a unique, cool cinematic experience. James Cameron delivers movies worth seeing on the biggest screen possible. And there's nothing like seeing a James Cameron movie in 3D. He does something unique and they feel like big experiences as you go throughout the film. They're immersive in a way that other films just aren't. I think the story here is better than the first Avatar. That's why it's higher up. Uh, I still don't think it's quite as compelling or maybe it's I'm just not as interested in the world of Pandora as potentially other stories that he could tell. But none of that takes away from the fact that he, he just makes these awesome experiences in the theater and, and it makes a world that is fascinating in a way that other directors just 
aren't using cinema this way. Then we have Frozen, a movie that as a parent of two little girls under the age of 10, I've seen roughly 7 billion times. Both of my little girls have gone through Elsa phases. They had the Elsa dress. In fact, my four-year-old dressed up as Elsa to go to Van Expo New Orleans just this past weekend, and then her older sister bought her a Lego, Lego minifigure of Elsa. So that was a lot of fun. But this movie delivered a bunch of memorable, fun characters in whether you're talking about Anna and Elsa or Olaf and others. Some of the most memorable, iconic Disney songs of the 21st century. I mean, the most memorable in like 30 years are all in this film. And unfortunately, I don't find the story and the pacing to line up with the quality of the characters in the songs. What I mean by that is as soon as you get past Let It Go, there's no more interesting songs in the movie. There's like one refrain where they redo a song they did earlier, uh, but the plot, like it gets real plot heavy and we're stuck in the snow and we're trying to fix Anna's heart and everything. So the first half, it's just like every three minutes is a classic song, a hilarious bit. And then the back half isn't quite as as compelling as the first half. And so a movie that's just kind of unbalanced for me. It's fascinating how uh, it gets the, everything that's so important so right. So it's a classic. Well, being clunky with its story. 22 Incredibles 2. And I know this is a movie that a lot of people were really disappointed in. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think in a lot of ways, it improves on a few things from the original Incredibles. Now, keep in mind, I didn't grow up with the original Incredibles. It came out when I was like 23, 24 years old. And so it kind of plays a little bit differently for me, but I've never loved Syndrome as a villain. And so I think Screen Slaver in certain ways works better for me in this film. It, Brad Bird has a great eye for action sequences. They're dynamic, they're energetic, and we're getting to see the, the family join in on all the fun and everything like that. <laughs> So for me, this was a solid follow-up to the original film. Next, Star Wars The Force Awakens. And this is a movie that would actually be significantly higher on this list, except the rest of the trilogy didn't deliver on the promise of this film. And so when I rewatched this movie, there's all these things like, oh, that's interesting. That could be fun. And now I know they're not going anywhere. That's not going to be a satisfying payoff. And it diminishes the experience. When I first watched this movie seven years ago, I was so thrilled to be back in this world. And absolutely, it's, you know, playing very much the safe path of following the template of A New Hope, but it did it well. It brought a 21st century pacing and aesthetic to it. I had a lot of fun with it. And there was all these, so much potential of where things were going. And then it didn't go there. <laughs> and so, um, I, I I loved it when it first came out, and it's still fun. I still enjoy it. There's still a lot here that I like, just not as much as it used to be now that I know that it's not going to deliver on the promise. We have made it to the top 20 with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I've said it many times before. I'm not like a gigantic Harry Potter fan. It's not a world that I specifically am interested in the same way that I'm not super interested in the world of Tolkien and Middle Earth. But that doesn't mean I dislike the films. And the original Harry Potter film is probably the one I've seen the most uh, because it, it came out first. And then I have kids. And so it's the one that they're able to watch the most and have been able to watch for the longest. And it, it's just a real fun little entry into the wizarding world. If just There's a certain playfulness to it where the later films kind of have a, an epic feel to them. This one is just playful discovering all these little things, wandering around Hogwarts, and just having youthful little adventures. And that's fun. And getting the director of Home Alone that knows how to work with kids and have that just little adventure, whimsical vibe to it. No, you've made a mistake. I mean, I can't be a, a, a wizard. I dig it. And so, like I said, these aren't like ones that I just go crazy for the way that many of you do, but that's still a great set of films. Number 19, Frozen 2. And I feel like this movie takes everything that was great about the first movie, gives us more of it, 
but a better balanced and paced version. And what I mean by that is at the beginning of this movie, our characters already know each other. So they're all there throughout the entire story. Does a better job of pacing out the songs. And the story, I think, is a, a, just a touch more compelling in the way that it's structured and how it ties in with the journey of our individual characters. So it just works a little bit better. Now, I don't think there's any songs as good as Let It Go, but both Show Yourself and Into the Unknown, I, I think those are way up there just below Let It Go. Those are great songs on their own. And so for me, it's got great songs, it's got the laughs, and it's just got a more balanced story for me. Next, Rogue One, a Star Wars story. For me, of the Disney era of Star Wars films, this is the best of the bunch. There's a little bit of clunkiness in the first two acts, but by the time you get to the end, it delivers the best space battle sequence since Return of the Jedi. It tells a more mature story in the world of Star Wars that doesn't depend on cute animals and cute droids that has a tragic yet satisfying ending to the film. And I love that it kind of shows us this other perspective on the rebellion, the part that's less clear what's right and wrong. And you see kind of the dirty side to the rebellion. It puts the war into Star Wars. And so this for me has risen up to be the best of the Disney era of films. 17, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows part two. I love good payoff. And as this film is the payoff of seven films of setup, it delivers on so many different levels. You get a massive battle for Hogwarts. You get Harry stepping into his destiny and battling Voldemort. But then you even have little moments with Neville Longbottom, the guy that was just the doofus joke in the original film, suddenly becoming this major piece of the victory in the film. He didn't die in vain, but you will, because you're wrong. And so it, it, it's a movie that is able to work so well because of all the work that was done beforehand. But that just means this one has so many satisfying moments for me. Number 16, Black Panther. One of the more mature films in the MCU that on a plot level has Shakespearean elements where it's all about this battle for this throne and manipulating different people and structures and family members all being at each other with long, deep histories. Um, while still allowing to have battle rhinos and sneaker puns in there at the same time. Uh, I think the thing that elevates it a good bit is Killmonger, where they were able to have a villain that has a certain point that makes sense, but he's still a villain. He needs to be defeated, but that doesn't mean he can't help our hero and Wakanda to see themselves and their purpose and role in the world a little bit differently so that they can serve others better through a guy that wanted to do evil. That's when you have an interesting and compelling conflict as your center of your film, when you can have someone that's complicated. They're wrong, they're evil, but there is some something right in their thinking. Then we have Spider-Man No Way Home, and this movie was just such a treat, such a gift for Spider-Man fans, where they found a way to pull off pulling in all of our cinematic live action Spider-Man into a film and have it work. And they didn't use that in the marketing. Like it was the worst kept secret in Hollywood, but at least there, there was some in, like, is it gonna happen? Is it gonna happen? And it did, and they didn't spoil it. And it wasn't just a quick cameo, it was 40 minutes of the movie, and it was just as good as you would have hoped it would be. But beyond that, it also, in a subversive way, completes this version of Peter Parker's origin story through the death of Aunt May and the lessons that he learns from that. And you kind of go, oh, that's clever. That's interesting what you're doing there. The thing that holds it back for me is I could just never fully buy into the inciting incident here this idea that a high schooler says to Dr. Strange something about casting a spell to mess with everyone's minds and Dr. Strange just goes along with it. It's just a little bit too lazy, too convenient. Brilliant, but lazy. Where 
wait a minute, the whole movie doesn't happen if they just pause for 30 seconds to talk through the parameters of a spell. That's a... <laughs> It's, it's so close to, to being interesting. And it's, it's like, oh, that doesn't quite work for me. So, so many awesome things. One of the best theatrical experiences I've ever had was opening night, watching this movie with a crowd, having already seen the movie. That was so cool. Um, I just wish there was a better way that they, mechanism by which they brought our Spider-Man together. Number 14, Skyfall, the 50th anniversary Bond film, and it's one of the absolute best of the franchise. Daniel Craig is my favorite of the Bonds, and a big part of that is that they, they made him more human and more vulnerable. He's still the awesome spy and the ladies' man and has all these incredible 21st century action sequences, but they show him as, as a person, too that has feelings, that has a background. And this movie in particular kind of dives into that and you see him as, as a person that a series of events led to him being the spy. And there was a history with the spies before him and those have consequences when you treat people in this manner. And it just made for a, a very fun, interesting, compelling Bond adventure with stakes, with sense of danger, while still feeling personal. Like, it's a thrilling third act, but in terms of Bond third acts, it's one of the smaller ones. And that's when I think you, you know you've done something really well with your film. Number 13, Toy Story 3. And when it comes to the Toy Story franchise, they're all excellent. So picking a favorite's tricky because they're all kind of perfect versions of what they're going for. And this one closes out the Andy trilogy, whereas movies one through three are all about Andy and his toys, and now he's leaving. And that's what's so brilliant about this franchise is, is it's, it's all about growing up in different phases of life and letting go and learning about those transitions. And so tying that to him going off to college and what does that mean for them um, just makes for such a compelling emotional story while just being about toys. There's all the last memorable sequences that you want. And this one, it's it's so good at what it's doing. It convinces you in one sequence that maybe they're going to kill off all of our toys by burning them all to death. No! Like, you know, they're not going to end a Pixar film by torching all of our characters, but the movie sucks you in so much that you get to that point and you're like, maybe they are going to torch all of my favorite toys. And it ends on such a satisfying note that closes out the Andy trilogy so well. Number 12, The Avengers. And with this movie, I was actually pretty skeptical when I saw the first trailers. I wasn't fully quite feeling it quite yet. And then I went to go see the movie and Kevin Feige and Joss Whedon absolutely cracked the code of how to have all these characters that are really quite different from one another. I mean, one of them is a space god, another's just a scientist, another's a World War II soldier, pulls them all together and has a con like a, a consistent tone that feels right. It's fun, it's funny, it still to this day has some of the best banter in all of the MCU. And because it was the first time they were doing this, they were able to do this very straightforward plot line about this invading disposable army. And it just makes for such a satisfying third act where every one of our heroes gets their moment in the spotlight to tear up some of the Chitauri, and it, the movie's able to get away with these little moments that shouldn't work, like Hulk smashing Loki on the ground and punching Thor. They should be too corny, but they just land because of the context, the tone that's been created. So it's not as complex as the later Avenger films, but it, it's like there's a pure fun to what happens here. Now on the total opposite end of comic book blockbusters, Joker. This is not a fun movie, but it is an interesting, compelling film where almost every other comic book movie is aiming to be a big action blockbuster with a bunch of quips thrown in to make it funny, fun, and entertaining. Joker goes hard in the opposite direction, pulls big inspiration from Taxi Driver, King of Comedy, all these Scorsese films, and finds a totally new, interesting direction to take the comic book movie genre. And 
part of what makes it so interesting, compelling, is at the center of the story is that we're rooting for Arthur, that we want him to find his confidence and his place in this world. And at the same time, we know all along the way, the way he's going to find that confidence, the way he's going to find his purpose is by becoming Joker. And so we're watching this tragedy unfold and his victories, we know are awful. They're terrible, but we're rooting for him. And it just makes for these interesting, conflicting feelings inside of us. So like I said, of, of, of a genre that feels oversaturated and there's a lot of very similar types of things in it. This one stands out as the serious character drama. We've made it to the top 10 with Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. And here we get the finale of the most epic and famous fantasy trilogy of all times. And they pulled it off. It's massive in scope and size, but it's still very personal when it comes to the emotions. There's all these characters, but it feels properly balanced. The action and spectacle are just as exciting that you want. And much like with Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, this is the payoff of everything that's come before. And it feels like the proper payoff. It builds off everything that came before and delivers satisfying conclusions. Now, the movie has way too many conclusions, but you don't care because it all works. It all pays off. It's all so satisfying. And it's like when you watch something that there's so many places it could have gone wrong and it doesn't. It's all just as good as it should be. That's what this is. And so even some of those that's not like bananas for the Middle Earth films, this is still a, a great, great film. Number nine, Toy Story 4. Now, I know a lot of you really didn't like this film and feel like Woody's acting way out of character, but obviously based off my placement, I see it very differently than you. And I think in different phases of life, you interpret different films in different ways and different plot lines resonate with you in different ways. And that's what I feel like with this film, that the older you are, you might interpret certain things a little bit differently and get something different out of it. As a point of reference, I was just as cynical about this film as anyone. I put out videos saying this is not a good idea. The previous movie closed out the trilogy so well, there's no story left to tell here. What are you doing? But what worked for me about this film is that immediately in the first 10 minutes, I realized Toy Story 3 closed out the, the Andy trilogy and their involvement with Andy's life, but that doesn't mean it closed out each individual character's arc. And so this movie closes out Woody's journey, where Woody was the leader when they were with Andy because of his position there. But as you go through life and things change in your different places, your relationship to the people around you shifts and changes. And that's what I got out of this film. And I thought it was just as funny as the other films. There's some great new characters like Duke Kaboom. There's a villain that I think is a little bit more compelling and layered than some of the other Toy Story villains. But that central arc for Woody, it, it worked for me. It made sense for me what they were going for. And it resonates with different things that I can think about in my life of how my relationship to people have changed, not because I, I don't like them anymore or abandoning them, but because I'm in a different place in life and so are they. Number eight, Captain America Civil War. And for me, the brilliance of this film is its ability to be a follow-up to Winter Soldier as well as Age of Ultron while setting up Black Panther as well as the breakup of the Avengers and Black, uh, Black Widow. There's a lot of movies I'm trying to remember. Does all of this at the same time while telling a coherent, cohesive story that feels like the natural continuation of where these characters would be that Captain America's journey from soldier in World War II to the guy that observed what happened in Winter Soldier, as well as Tony Stark's journey as a guy that realizes his own poor decision-making in leading to Age of Ultron and how he's so frequently his own worst enemy would cause them to be in very different places when it came to the Sokovia Accords and have strong, passionate feelings about it that there's a compelling enough narrative here that eight years later, 
Seven years later, how many years it's been, we're still debating who was right. I put out a video just a couple weeks back and people are split 50-50 both ways as to who they thought was in the right in this film. And that's when you know you have a compelling narrative where it's not just simple black and white, it's different value sets, different um, perspectives coming in conflict where each is kind of right, each is kind of wrong, and of course, we got some amazing action sequences in the airport sequence, which is just, you know, nerd's dream come true of all their toys playing around <laughs> in the same playground. And then you get the finale where it's too, very personal, small stakes, but two of our heroes duking it out. Number seven, Titanic. And as I said before with the Avatar films, James Cameron is simply able to make these immersive films that just suck you into the world and take you on this big sweeping adventure. And in the case of Titanic, he takes you back to 1912 and on that journey of these characters in the first half of the film, you're swept up in their optimism and what they see the Titanic as. And you feel this excitement for the journey all the while knowing where it's leading. And as you move into the back half of the film, you just feel the tragedy. You feel the scope, the size. It's devastating. It's heartbreaking. It's thrilling. And it does all of this at the same time in a way that, like I said, there's just something unique about the way that James Cameron pulls you into these worlds, worlds, it makes you feel all these emotions. Then we have Avengers Endgame, the epic conclusion to the Infinity Saga that absolutely delivered a satisfying conclusion. The first third of the film is an interesting exploration of all the different ways the Avengers deal with grief and loss. Then we get time travel hijinks, all of it leading to the best hour of fan service ever put to film, where it's fan service done right. It's all earned, it fits into the plot, but it's also like, oh, that was cool, we got to see that. Oh, that was amazing. And it's so fun, it's so satisfying every single time that I watch that last hour of this film. And just as a theatrical experience, once again, one of the best theatrical experiences watching Endgame, opening night, packed theater, and just watching the reactions of everyone around me as Captain America picks up the hammer. As the portals start to open, it's just so good. They, in the this massive set of films, they delivered a fantastic finale to all of it. In fifth place, Top Gun Maverick. One of my earliest childhood memories is of watching the original Top Gun with my family. It's one of those movies that's just always been with me. And as soon as they put out the first trailers for this film, I got good vibes that I think they're gonna do this right. I think that this thing's actually gonna work. And then I, the first reviews came out and they were through the roof. I finally got to see it and it was just as good as I'd hoped, if anything, better than I'd hoped. And I ended up watching it four times in a week and I could have watched it a fifth time the next day. It is just so good. It was perfect, perfect, everything, down to the last minute details. It's so, such a crowd-pleasing film. And I've continued to rewatch it now that it's on home video. I just put this movie on all the time to watch the scenes, to watch the whole movie. I own it. I was at a hotel this past weekend. It was on the TV. And we just sat down and watched it again for like the zillionth time in the last nine months. Because it's just so good. I love the characters. I love that they actually flew up in jets. Working with the Navy 15 months to figure out how to get the cameras in these things. It just delivers everything. As much as I love the first film, this movie builds on its legacy and does everything better. In fourth place, The Lion King, and this is my favorite animated film of all time. I was the perfect age to grow up with the Disney Renaissance, where I remember seeing 
Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Lion King in the theater as a child. Those are the animated films of my childhood. And that's just such a phenomenal run. And this is my favorite of the bunch where it has iconic, memorable songs. It has great characters and at its core, a fantastic story that's emotionally resonant. And it plays with you one way when you're a child and then you resonate and connect with different things as you grow older. And so I loved it when it first came out and I still love it to this day. Real quick, before I give you my top three, remember to join me down below in the comment section. Share your ranking of all 52 movies that have made a billion dollars. I put the full list of movies in the description so you don't have to look it up yourself and I'd love to see your list. Also, if you enjoyed this video and you're new to my channel, I've done a zillion other rankings just like this. Up here in this playlist is a bunch of my ranking of the most popular movie franchises out there. So if you enjoyed this video, you'll almost certainly enjoy something up there. In third place, Avengers Infinity War. This is my favorite film in the MCU. He's the best. Love it. And it delivers everything that I love about these movies, where they're able to take all of these characters from very different franchises, very different tones, and pull them all together and have it feel consistent. And there's just something that's so much fun about watching these characters interact with one another and on such a large scale. The basic plot is fairly simple and straightforward. It's a MacGuffin story about a bunch of Infinity Stones and who will get to them first, but that provides so many opportunities for just massive action sequences and fun banter between the characters. I'm Peter, by the way. Doctor Strange. Oh, you're using your made up names. Um. I'm Spider-Man then. But the thing that really elevates this film is giving us the most compelling villain in the MCU, in Thanos, as this guy driven mad by seeing something terrible happen, and he comes up with this just horrible villainous scheme, but he truly believes he's doing the right thing. And you can tell the heartbreak as he makes hard choices in his quest to do the thing that he thinks will save the galaxy. It makes just for this compelling story and has a truly shocking conclusion at the end of it. So it just has everything that I want from a comic book movie. A runner up, The Dark Knight. And here Christopher Nolan follows up Batman Begins by giving us this complex, compelling narrative that doesn't just pull from the comic books, but also pulls from some of the best crime thrillers out there to deliver this film that's absolutely captivating from beginning to end. Now, of course, people talk about how great the Joker is and it's this interesting new version, a phenomenal performance from Heath Ledger, and that's all true. But you also have this journey of Bruce Wayne who's trying to figure out how do I save the city ball, not being trapped as the Batman forever. All of it with this complex web of things going on in the city. And it just kind of comes together to de deliver this exciting, thrilling story with big emotions, interesting ideas, and it just stands out as something different in this genre. And when you're able to do that with such an oversaturated genre, you've done something special. Christopher Nolan is one of my absolute favorite directors, phenomenal cast. It just kind of has it all. Um, and it's one of those movies that has stood out in the genre for a reason. But coming in at number one is Jurassic Park, one of my absolute favorite films where just several things all came together to do something special, where you have Spielberg and John Williams in their prime adapting the best material from a prolific author in Michael Crichton. And right at this moment where the technology allowed them to do something special and just it all came together to deliver something fantastic that in the first half of the film, it's just remarkable to see dinosaurs brought to life and it captures that so well with the awe and the wonder. You did. You crazy son of a bitch, you did. And you see the reactions from these different characters, but the characters are also balanced out. So each of them brings a different perspective on this idea of what if dinosaurs were brought back, brought back to life on this island. Yeah, but your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. And then the back half, 
you get the thrilling adventure of everything going wrong and it does all of it right. So it's just one of these examples of all the pieces coming together, delivering easily one of the greatest blockbusters of all time, where if you want some thoughtful sci-fi looking at some ideas, you've got that in there. If you want exciting action sequences, you have it. If you want amazing music, you've got it. Just watch just the awe of seeing dinosaurs, you get it. It has it all. I love this movie. It's so rewatchable. It stands the test of time. So it comes in at number one. If you want more rankings just like this, check out that playlist right over there. If you want some delicious coffee delivered right to your front door, check out Cometeer down below in the description. Thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and TV too much. Bye-bye.